Hi, Chad. Right. Thanks for editing. Just shout out to the editor. I'm really excited. Uh, today, we have a great guest. Uh, first, if you haven't realize what you're listening to. Welcome to Thought Crimes. Uh, on Thought Crimes, we discuss the hardest parts of our behavior to deliver tactics to take control of our behavior and our lives. On this show, we cover burnout, personality, sleep, neuroticism, and more. Today, Hillary Lynn is on the podcast. She is a physician and the co-founder of Curio, a digital care navigation platform, which offers mental health education, coaching, and it includes psychedelic-assisted coaching for mental health conditions. Um, so let's jump right in. Welcome, Hillary. Thank you so much for having me, Peter. This is fantastic. Um, I'm really excited. So uh, let's dive in. Let's talk about the past first, right? So you spent a portion of your career as an internal medicine physician at Stanford Health. Do you want to just kind of talk about your early path to Curio from that, right? How did you end up, uh, you know, in the psychedelics arena, in the behavioral health arena? Yeah. Happy to. And it's a long winding journey. But the shorter version of it was I was a good academic physician to be for a very long time. I went into medicine because I saw it as a very noble calling. And I still think it is. But I do think that the reality of healthcare was quite a bit different than I, I thought as a med student. Um, there's I, I tell people often that the golden age of being a doctor has kind of passed. And now we live in a world where the incentives of big corporate medicine really don't work out in the patient or the doctor's favor. So I grew very frustrated with a lot of the feelings that both, you know, I and many other doctors have, and we call it burnout, but I, I've heard the phrase like moral outrage. And I mm -hmm. think that is a lot more appropriate because, uh, Essentially, you're being forced to work in a system that doesn't allow you to do the right thing for the patient much of the time. So that was very frustrating. And it took me almost a full decade later to realize that I just couldn't make it work in that world. So I turned to startups. Um, it was a much longer thought process than just jumping there. But I saw it as an opportunity to make a bigger and uh, more positive impact with, you know, my skill set and and all these ideas that I had. And I love the autonomy and the creativity of being in the startup space. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. It's funny. Uh, you kind of like mentioned the idea of maybe rushing into it. Um, I've started a, a few things and um I, I invest in advise uh, startups. And one of the things I do, but if people come really early, is I ask them to explain to me, prepare an hour of material, why they should not do it. Yeah. Uh, because if they haven't thought through all of those things ahead of time, they're going to run into them anyways. And so it's better to <laughs> at least have done some precursor thinking. So it's good to know that you didn't, you didn't just rush into it, but you definitely had sound, sounds like you had a pretty strong drive from like, you know, um, a desire for like this openness is like this, this, this sort of um, trying to think of a better term than wild west, but like with the positive aspects of a wild west, yeah. right? You have less regulations and less like forced activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also think, um, you know, to bring it more personally, I always, I'm one of those people and maybe this isn't totally healthy, but you know, my career is a part of my self-actualization. <laughs> and uh, I think that's what hit me really hard. Like when it wasn't working out in that way for a traditional clinical path. And so being a founder and CEO really m accentuates that part of the journey. You're like, oh, this company is me self-actualizing, like my mission in life. And I really feel strongly about that. Uh, I, I still have that idealism, I guess. Like, I haven't lost it yet. So Nice. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. That one's so hard. The founder journey mm -hmm. there is so challenging because you have this fine line where like, on one hand, you have this passion that you're utterly convinced of, right? You're a smart person. You've done the work. You're like, wow, this is utterly, th this is worth my like blood, right? And then on the other hand, you have the ups and downs of a startup. And so you mm -hmm. have to like deal with that continuity. Like there's these continuity errors that emerge, right? Yeah. You have to, you have to have the right personality for it. I, I tell people this all the time. I'm like, there's no right or wrong way to live your life or choose a career. For me, I just happen to be a right combination of personality traits. So like some of those things are, you know, I mentioned, I really love autonomy. It, it comes from growing up, I think with a single mom who we're both immigrants and 
uh, I had to figure out a lot of logistics for the household. And after a while you get used to it, you're like, I'm, I'm driving this car. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm leading the ship kind of a feeling. And uh, you don't get that when you're in the middle of a, a gigantic hierarchy, like it is in healthcare. Uh, and right. yeah. And then also I mentioned the creativity aspect. I'm always jumping from one wild idea to another. And the challenge of course is implementing that idea in a way that makes sense is a good business and actually solves a needed problem. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hit the nail on the head. I, I'm super curious. So we can take like a, a side tangent. Yeah. Um, were you the quintessential like translator child as well? Like were, or were, were your Parents actually, it's funny mom. thing. Yeah, yeah. I live with my mom and she actually really wanted to learn English. So okay. I had a totally different experience where I spoke zero English and mm -hmm. then I moved to the US, immediately was dropped in kindergarten. I remember the funniest things. Like I was learning, like, well, A, I thought it was ridiculous that nobody in my class knew the alphabet. Like I, I was from Taiwan and I knew the alphabet. Mm. And then the second part of it was I also um, was learning both concepts and words at the same time. Like I didn't know what a dinosaur was. Right. And like I learned <laughs> the concept of a dinosaur as well as the word for a dinosaur at the same time. Um, but uh, my mom actually, to answer your question, actually really wanted to practice English. So I had this funny event where I forgot all of my Mandarin and Taiwanese like very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for the ages of five to 13, I actually spoke only English. And then at age 13, I went back for literally three weeks, lived with my aunt who spoke nothing but Mandarin and, and a little bit of French, which wasn't helpful. <laughs> and, like, yeah. And then uh, it all came back. It like, it was just in there in my brain. Um, so then I started speaking Mandarin, like quite conversationally since then. So it's kind Very of a wild journey. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, thanks for sharing. Uh, yeah, yeah it's, um, th yeah, there, there's a, there's a lot there. We, we won't go too deep, but, uh, yeah, okay. thanks for sharing. Yeah. I'll leave it there. Um, and so bringing it back to your, your sort of, uh, career journey, right? This idea of self-actualization, what, like, how did you come to Kirio? So you were frustrated. You came to startups. Why Kirio? Right. Yeah, it came from my experience. So I also worked for some time in oncology and uh, I actually thought I was going to become an oncologist and I still am in touch with a lot of my former colleagues. But what I saw there and in many places in medicine was the fact that we are so concentrated and focused on solving this problem of extending life by like one week or like one month or something like that. And we, right. we kind of lost the big picture of like, oh, what does this even mean like to face mortality? What is the value of a human life? Like, you know, like what is the significance of this whole experience? So we never covered that in oncology. Like if you saw an oncologist's office, it's like five minute visits where you go in and you're like trying to be appropriately sad while like being very stressed out because you're like, I have 30 more patients and then you're like, and then yeah. you're explaining really tough concepts like around the treatment and like what to expect. And it's just a nightmare. So, yeah. um, so I, I understand why it's ended up this way, but it's just very sad. And, uh, and I was like, at the end of the day, most people wouldn't choose to undergo certain treatments if they really understood like, uh, you know, what was going on. So, and, and so that's one piece, that's like an education communication piece. Mm -hmm. But the second piece was actually around understanding your emotional self and your emotional life that was missing from everywhere in healthcare. And to bring up a personal story, I had a cousin who was also a doctor and he actually like, he had a great life. Like, you know, had a wonderful wife, two kids, a big house. And um, he unfortunately got lymphoma in his thirties and it oh, was geez. a terrible form of it. And he ended up passing away. Um, and that was tragic, but I think what really hit home for me was the fact that he was, you know, he was like aiming for all of these like milestones and he achieved them. But I think he really sought something that he never got to accomplish. And, and I think it was related to his career and like understanding his meaning and purpose. And, um, I think I saw in that, the missing piece that most of us don't get a chance to explore is like, what is what gives me meaning, what gives me purpose and what gives me value. And if we had that, we wouldn't bother chasing a lot of these su superficial things. So, yeah. um, and 
So I created Curio because I wanted to solve two related issues. One was your emotional understanding and two is, um, you know, the communication problem in healthcare. It, it's related, I swear. It's in, it's in my head, but it's related. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we've created now is a mental health, behavioral health focused startup that uh, emphasizes the communication and education piece. So care navigation is the healthcare lingo for it, right. but the actual pieces of it are helping patients understand better what is going on with their condition and their treatments, making the right decisions for them. And then as a big part of that is the mental health piece. So. Right, absolutely, right. Uh, yeah, you, you touched on this. The word um, I'm familiar with is, informed consent right that's like mm -hmm. the buzzword yeah and it's it's funny because it's um you you can see this like the corollary in in tech is like the end user license agreement is informed consent you're consenting yeah. to like have your data and then when people understand what they've consented to retrospectively they're like can i take it back yeah <laughs> right yeah can you yeah. have it back <laughs> right, mm -hmm. right so it, but that but it's really complex right it's not like a doctor it's, yeah can mm -hmm. just uh, yeah, a doctor a doctor has a very tough job in that particular um, space, right? Like instead yeah. of one job with limited information of like, oh, you got a bum knee, <laughs> here's <laughs> here's something to throw on it. Now it's like really complex precision medicine, right? Preci you know, um, all especially for oncology. Yeah, so very cool, mm -hmm. very cool. Um, care navigation is a new one for me. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't know that was the buzzword. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's it's just a category describing a solution that helps. Uh, you can think of Curio as your partner in mental health from the start of the journey forever on. So, yeah. And another way I would pose it is I was once asked this question by an investor and I thought it was a good one because it's something we've thought about is if you are creating a treatment for a patient, mm -hmm. why are you incentivized to cure that patient? Like, don't mm -hmm. you want them sick? And that's what pharma companies do. Awesome. They they only create things that sort of make things better, but then you're hooked forever. Oh, so yeah. um, psychedelics actually, interestingly, because it's closer to a cure, I always hesitate to say a cure, but it's closer to a cure. Um, it's uh, a lot of people question that is like, why do you want to create a treatment that essentially gets rid of the problem and you make right. no more money? And um, that actually, we thought about that very deeply. And that's the reason why we're sitting in the space we are, because we want to, people need a home, like, like a healthier home, or in this case, a mental health care home, where you can rely on us to give you unbiased information and guidance no matter where you are, whether you are well, you are ill, you are not feeling great, whatever. And, uh, you know, our hope is that we can support a person from I'm feeling depressed to going through a psychedelic or other treatment right. for their mental health to being like, okay, I'm well, how do I stay well and, and meditate or, or whatever else that right. entails. Do you meditate? Just out of curiosity. Do you, I, do, I do. I do. I am a profoundly bad meditator, but I do it. <laughs> every single day so i, I don't think that yeah. means you're a bad meditator i think <laughs> i think that's the whole idea of a practice versus you know like you can't you can't perfect it right yeah yeah um, i have teammates who are way more dedicated like i um one of my co-founders and cto mateo he is like a 15 to 20 year long meditator and he he can sit down and meditate anywhere for like an hour straight yeah like just in a busy room it, it's wild <laughs> So. That's very cool. Yeah, he must have. He must have. Um, there is a cool. Uh, I went to a guided meditation recently, and the woman who was guiding it, uh, her name's Lopan Chandra Easton. She's very cool, and she said meditation helps still the flame of your mind where life is the buffeting wind, and so it's mm -hmm. like putting a glass over the flame so it can stay still. So it sounds like Mateo's got a very still flame. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> cool. um, very cool. And so let's, yeah, let's talk about psychedelics. Psychedelics as a cure. Um, you know, I think some people are finally becoming familiar and, and maybe getting less afraid of psychedelics. It's um, to, to me, my, my stance on it is that uh, coming, coming from like a first principles perspective, it's crazy mm. that alcohol is so widely accepted and legal as a recreational drug. Like, totally fine. It yeah. destroys your body and it destroys lives and, and people die on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have something like MDMA or psilocybin or, you know, even LSD, which is one of the hardcore um, uh, psychedelics, right? It, it's still, um, you know, schedule one, type one. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is the same to us as like cocaine and heroin. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't really... Uh, 
you know, I know we didn't, we didn't prep this before, but I am curious about like, I, from my perspective, a drug is not a drug is not a drug. Yeah. So what, how, how do you categorize psychedelics in your mind? Just like, yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. So to give you context, I definitely grew up in a culture which was very drug averse, you know, of, of any kind. Like I, I think many other Asian Americans or anybody who comes from a traditional culture would say so. And, uh, and I had to learn myself like the, mm. and, and I'm always about that. Like, I, I think that's a big reason why I'm an entrepreneur is that mm. I'm a questioner. Like yeah. I question why it is that I feel this way or why it is that I've been taught this. And, uh, when I came down to it, I asked myself two questions. I'm like, is this harmful? And you're right. It's way less harm, less harmful than alcohol, certainly, which is like the worst and most prevalent drug we have in our society. And, uh, and then the second thing is, um, you know, what is it that's bothering me about it? And I think, um, I think what it is, I had to get over this second point a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, was, you know, if you are altering your experience of the world and your consciousness, is it real? And what I realized is that, you know, actually, if you look at the hard facts, none of us know what real is. We, yeah, yeah. We're just like these biological blobs with like perceptron and like our eyeballs and ears and whatever. We're trying to discern something called reality, but we actually don't know what it is. And, uh, and so that got me over that particular hump. And I realized like a psychedelic is a powerful tool like a hammer, like fire, like our hands, like you can use it for good and for bad. And I am very pro using it for good. And I actually think it is a useful tool because it mostly does good. Like you, you very rarely can like use it for something terrible. So um, I'm very, I'm very pro that. And, but to answer your original question, it's simply cultural, like the drug war, the war against drugs and everything else. Like, whereas alcohol like um uh, centuries and centuries ago right like it's in the bible like we've mm -hmm. been drinking alcohol it, it like grows on trees that sort of a thing so it's just a part of our culture it's not a good reason it's just it's just there so uh, gra grandfathered in right yeah, exactly uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and then and then we kind of we kind of like i guess culture likes cannabis enough that we're like okay we're gonna we're gonna yeah. squeeze this one in here and then yeah. people yeah. are like wait a second the harm the harm of these two now that they're both like legal in many states it's like starting mm -hmm. the, I, I think the public is starting to see that and they're like well what else can we measure with that delta right, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's really positive. It's a good question. The comparison between cannabis and psychedelics comes up a lot. And I think um, they're both like equally or I don't know, whatever. We don't really know. Like, but they're right. around the same tier of not harmful. And I also wonder a lot about like how we position it, because how you position a substance all also leads to how it's useful or not. Right. Um, and cannabis is largely seen as a recreational, like a uh, hangout and chilling with friends kind of a drug. And that's all fine and good. But I actually think as a result, we've missed out on some of the medical uses for cannabis. And that is, it's incredible. Like what you can do with marijuana products for like pain relief, like, like anxiety relief, sleep, like all these other stuff. And a lot of people don't respect it that way because it is a hangout drug. So right. yeah. Um there's a quote uh, uh, from Eric Davis. Uh, he's a journalist who writes about um, like consciousness, subculture. He talks a lot about psychedelics. He's really deep in the psychedelic field. Um, and he said, um, I asked him, you know, I, I've been really conservative in my personal use of psychedelics. I've never used psychedelics. I've, I've approached it very carefully. Um, and I, I won't get too much into my background, but I, I suffered from depression. So I was like really open to the idea that like, maybe this will cure me, right? Like you said, yeah. um, and I asked him about it and he said, his attitude is you can treat it like a playground or a temple, but don't mix those two. Yeah. That's his, that's his take. Oh, that I love the way you put that. Yeah. It, and it's like, uh, to go to, you know, psychedelic lingo, it's, uh, it's all about your intention. Mm -hmm. going into it and you're right if you just clarify what this experience is going to be then you're set up for success whatever direction you decide to go in so cool yeah so let's talk about the benefits mm -hmm. um so what is your research and work found in terms of benefits um like in, in terms of like uh longevity of benefits in psychedelic use 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, so the risks and um, the benefits and the longevity of psychedelic use um, going into it is it's like at the first glance, so profoundly much, but at the same time, we know so little so far about the research. So I want to put that up as a caveat because I don't think anybody knows the answer, but I also think that it's a very flexible treatment. So you can, like we mentioned, orient it in so many different ways. Um, Broadly speaking, it's a way to close the gap between reason and emotion is, is how I think of it. So, and a lot of the research shows that. So at end of life, for example, because I worked a lot with um, palliative care, uh, is that a lot of people are facing mortality and they're feeling really down and really depressed, but they may logically understand, or maybe people tell them logically, like, um, you know, everybody dies and this is like a natural part of life. So when you use a psychedelic in end of life, then you help a person close that gap between, oh my God, like I'm freaking out and I'm super depressed and I don't know what to do. And logically being like, everybody dies and this is a natural process and we're all going to go through this at some point. Um, so that is, uh, that, that's just one use case. And it's been shown in studies that it does help people get over that existential anxiety. Um, and every other case, it's very similar. There's added, um, there's added interesting uh, use for something like ketamine, by the way, which is, I think, different somewhat than some of the other psychedelics. So for just to bring that up, ketamine, most of the studies have been using ketamine as an antidepressive agent. Mm. And I think some of it is the psychological benefit. Like I mentioned, you, you know, get into a subjective state and then you uh, uh, before, during and after can work around these emotional uh, barriers. And then you feel you know, better afterwards. But there's also a direct chemical effect of ketamine just dissociates you and people have an immediate antidepressant effect. That's Mm. not necessarily the case for all compounds. So just to delineate. And, um, And the dissociative nature of ketamine also is very interesting. And some scientists have suggested that it's more useful for um, anxiety and other sort of mental health conditions where you have like a high, like a high, uh, how would I put it? Like a, a fear factor or like a high anxiety factor, high stress factor, uh, versus something like stable suicidality, depression, where you can, you know, take something in, um, and go through a very profound, like psilocybin or ayahuasca experience. And, and, you know, you might undergo some sort of fear there, but it's, it's not the same as an anxious person going through that. Absolutely. If I were to put in my words, I guess it's like, Mm -hmm. you're saying the dissociative nature of ketamine is maybe for more acute conditions, right? Like I'm having a panic attack. It'll, it'll dissociate me from the immediate negative effects of that. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I'm not going to throw in all these like caveats uh, from sure, what sure. I But yeah, roughly so. Like it's right. it's better. It's better for somebody who is prone to maybe fearing uh, being fearful or like being very anxious. So right. How, mm-hmm. how do you feel about, um, you know, this is going down a rabbit hole of ket- ketamine. I know it's like really popular recreationally with like younger people. Mm-hmm. Um, does that concern you? Or like, I, I guess, uh, well, I'm sure it would concern anyone. It's like, oh, kids are using drugs. Right. But, but mm-hmm. um, what is your thoughts on it? Like in your mind, is it good that it's being sort of normalized that people are trying to use this or do you think that it's like um doing more harm than good because it is kind of caught on so recreationally yeah what what's your take on that yeah i think you know i'm of two minds there's the part of me that's just like you know if people are largely being safe then i and i stay out of you know like i mentioned i think what people choose to do recreationally is less my concern right. but i do worry that it really is casting the shadow over psychedelics like all psychedelics not just ketamine and i i am fearful about what that's going to do for the image of therapeutic psychedelic work um also there's risks to ketamine and uh some of them are you know you can get cystitis it feels like you have a uti or urinary tract infection um without any sort of infection there being there you can get addicted and it's one of the psychedelics which is addictive um it's far less addictive than alcohol or certainly smoking we're really 
anything else we think of as addictive, but it is still a little bit addictive. So these concerns worry me. And I would prefer, honestly, that people weren't, you know, getting it off the streets and using it in that way for these reasons. Um, and also, I think it's causing regulatory bodies to really lash back in, in negative right. ways. So Mm -hmm. Right. It's like uh, it's like anything that that needs a lot of regulation. It's not necessarily like when regulators come in, it's probably better that like the smart folks have already figured out what an ethical rule of thumb is and then help the regulators ease into it rather than, oh, gosh, we got to do something. They're always going to take the most conservative and repressive approach. Historically. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I read a really good breakdown by uh, like a subsec writer uh, who like studies like these regulatory bodies. And they mentioned like a lot of times it's it's not necessarily their fault. It's just simply not their expertise. Like the DEA, for example, is not clinical in nature. They're not made up of doctors. You know, they're made up of, you know, people who care about drug trafficking, you know? So, right. um, yeah. So, you know, just to bring it up in case listeners are thinking about it, there was a recent proposal made by the DEA to limit controlled substance prescribing over telemedicine again, because we had like, you know, changes with COVID and everything. And uh, we, uh, along with about 30,000 other people, apparently submitted a public comment to that. And really just touching on the fact that, you know, not all controlled substances are the same. There are several that are extremely beneficial for health, mental health specifically. Ketamine is one of them. You know, there's Suboxone, which is used to help people get off of uh, heroin type products. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's several very, very helpful and useful controlled substances that uh, unfortunately are inaccessible with these rules if you aren't located by an available doctor. And that's like, most people in America, unfortunately, like, you know, if you don't live in an urban area and if you're even if you are in an urban area, if your insurance covered provider doesn't have availability for like the next six months, like th there's so many barriers. So, yeah. Oh, man, <laughs> you, you were talking about the problems of the medical industry. Um, mm -hmm. I briefly worked in oncology data at, a, at a, a company. It was a precision medicine like metrics company basically we helped we helped uh we, we were kind of sitting in the middle between like researchers providers um and then these like labs and then the actual pharma companies sitting behind us with these giant bags of money like okay when do we come in yeah. <laughs> and uh right. we would do these we would do these cluster analysis uh on my team we would run these cluster analysis to uh figure out like what what turnaround time was against uh indicators right and so or what indications right and we were doing one on acute myeloid leukemia, which uh, you're very yeah. familiar, I'm sure, mm -hmm. <laughs> kills people very quickly if it's if yeah. it's bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, like it can kill people in two weeks. And we found out you're talking about major metropolitan areas. There was also a socioeconomic trend where mm -hmm. basically rich people in Stanford had less than a day of turnaround time on average. Mm -hmm. And there was yeah. this cluster in Detroit that had a 15 day turnaround time for acute myeloid leukemia. And I was like, oh, <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> You know, anyone who is really sick had to get moved. You know, it's not, it's, if you just take it at face value, you're like, oh, people are dying before they get the results. It's like, no, you have to leave your home. You have all of these yeah. barriers, like you're saying, in order to get diagnosed with something, just to get diagnosed. Uh, yeah. 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 It's, um, it's a nightmare. So until we invent teleportation, um, you know, we, we got the, we got Zoom, we got these other telecommunication pro products. So. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah. And and also now you can get like blood tests at home. So things are moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of things moving in any direction, right? Um, is there any part of you that feels that this could be like a hype way or, or maybe a better way of phrasing this question, right? So, um, you know, psychedelics had this, this great revolution um what is it like, like this the 60s yeah. through the 70s and then you had this backlash of regulators because of the like you know the cults that emerged and like the yeah. things that went went south with this um and now we're having this new renaissance um are you at all concerned with that do you think about that this like this being hype or a fad because celebrities are jumping on board because it's cool and influencers mm -hmm. are talking about it um you know yeah i i won't even um i'm just gonna leave it open-ended what are your thoughts on this like yeah, I'm so torn because on the one hand, the celebrities of the world, of course, are bringing attention to a very important, uh, you know, topic, psychedelics for therapeutic use. On the other hand, I do get this like unease with a lot of 
uh, the excitement coming out being much more towards like recreational excitement, honestly. Like I, I think a lot of people who are excited, they're just like, drugs are fun. Like, you know, and, and I'm just like, that's, I, I, I get it, but it's also, it's not very helpful to the entire movement. And we have a lot of very serious people to convince who are not going to appreciate that angle. So I, I worry that because of that like sentiment that uh, the serious work that is being done on the science side, on the medicine side, will will lose ground. So, mm -hmm. We, we, we're fighting so hard for this yeah. to be taken seriously, to be yeah. used correctly. And then you have someone who's like, I fucking love this, dude. Yeah. This, this <laughs> fucking best. You're like, you're not the best spokesperson for our right. work. Yeah, right. yeah, totally. Just Got like it. that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just like that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, just a, a total tangent. Um, are you familiar with the DSI movement at all? Like decentralized science and yeah. Yeah, what, what, I what, am. That's in the overlap because I know there's some psychedelic overlap with this. Uh, we talked to a, a team, Quantified Citizen, uh, about their work, actually. And also, it's um, and there's like a lot of people trying to do this. And I think it's a fantastic effort. What I worry about, and, uh, and actually, you know, I was trying to figure out ways to bring Curio into the decentralized movement. I was like, there's something here. I love it. But the, the trouble is, it's hard to onboard the layperson or the traditional clinician to something like uh, blockchain. Like it, it's just hard. It's right. like, even I remember I was buying like crypto kitties and I was like, Oh my God, like I have to get a MetaMask account and like, you know, this browser extension. And then now like DAO is like, like, and there's manifestos and like, there's so many things to figure out, which your average non, you know, into it person is not going to understand. So I fear more that the barriers are too great more than like, you know, I'm very excited about the idea of it. I just don't know that it's, it's like the time right now. But, right. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, um, I, I used to work in blockchain and people would say like, okay, we're going to solve this problem with a DAO. And I would yeah. always tell people, okay, now you have two problems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you have exactly. DAO and your problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. It's, um, a, it's a nightmare. So. Right. And, and mm -hmm. uh, there are some slim use cases, which are exciting, but yeah, I, I probably net agree with you, which is like the, the barriers right now are too high. I'm mm -hmm. hoping that they'll lower because the whole idea, yeah. um, uh, I, I've seen intimately close how research science can be like uh, to a total mess like yeah. behind the studies, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do science ourselves actually. And it's uh, we're trying to do it in the most logical, cleanest way possible because it is it is industry science and it has to move faster than like in, you know, I was at Stanford for over a decade and it was so slow. I couldn't even get like, the IRB at Stanford to approve anything touching digital health. Like it was yeah. just a total nightmare. And so we're trying to run a solid process ourselves, but agreed, like even like interfacing with uh, traditional IRBs and, and things like that, you have to like make concessions that sometimes don't make any sort of logical sense. Cause you're like, I'm trying to make this study like apply to real life here. And, and like, you're, you're harping on things that like, and making us do things that are just, super artificial so uh, it is kind of a, a mess as it is and i hope there is going to be changes in the research field so. yeah I'm, mm -hmm. I'm on the same page i've actually never told this story publicly and so mm -hmm. sorry sorry Ooh. stanford but mm -hmm. uh my first company uh we stanford was our first customer so i Ooh. spent a year on campus there and one of the things i went in we, we had to teach the administrators how to use the platform and i started with this technical presentation thinking like okay, these guys are going to be savvy. It's, you know, we'll, we'll get yeah. it quickly. And they, someone raised their hand. They said, can you show me how to download an iPhone app? And then everyone in the room was like, oh, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> and this was, this was, I think 2013. Yeah. 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 Like, it wasn't like, it wasn't like a long time ago. Like, no. it, yeah, I'm it not did. shocked. I'm not shocked. I, I, I'm sort of convinced that the only place in Silicon Valley where IT specialists still have career stability is at hospitals. Mm. And it's simply like, because, you know, people at hospitals are too busy, like I alluded to, like, we don't learn a lot in clinician world, like we don't learn more about new technologies. Uh, I can't tell you how many people who like, 
curse like EHRs like up and down. They're just like, oh my God, it's the worst thing that ever happened. I liked it when it was all on scraps of paper that I could just hand to my nurse and they'll take care of it, whatever it is. And yeah, now that doctors have to actually interface with a machine it's it's mind-blowingly hard for them so yeah absolutely mm -hmm. any anyone listening if you're not familiar ehr just means electronic health record so yeah. it's yeah. Your, your, <laughs> your charts in the hospital on a computer mm -hmm. um yeah so okay we're talking about these hurdles um i know from personal experience like it's so it's so messed up if you have anything go wrong with your mental health it's really hard to find help it's very mm -hmm. challenging um, so from your perspective, what is the future of this? Like, how do we give people better access? How do we make it easier? Yeah, the access gap is so key. So a lot of people go about it the uh, way of describing, oh, we don't have enough therapists. We don't have enough doctors. There's going to be a shortage of like 500,000 therapists in year 2040 or something. And, and that really is around about the number that I've seen. But like, that's like, there's not enough humans to therapize other humans, like truly, like if you talk about it, like not even enough people are that, uh, that educated, like, you know, so I don't think the solution is to get more humans. And I've written about this a lot and I ran about it all the time. I'm like, you know, in healthcare, it's very tempting to throw more humans at a problem. Uh, kind of like that scenario I told you, like, doctors when they're really busy they literally just like shout at another person in the room it's like do something like you know like <laughs> it's just someone do something like you know like get another person we need more people clearly the solution is we need more people and uh uh i was explaining that actually when you put more humans in the mix it you actually get way more problems like more humans more problems because the the communication is a uh, a uh, junction of failure. So yeah. when I'm saying, help me do this, like the person hearing me is like, uh, what does that mean? Like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna like uh, write an email to the patient saying, your doctor told you to, you know, take this medicine, you know, once a week or something. And then like, there's so many gaps there. Like no one understands what anybody else is saying. And then you end up with huge numbers of mistakes. So actually the solution is, uh, slimming down the team and training up the existing team and then augmenting their skills with technology. That latter part is the tricky part because like I mentioned, a lot of people in healthcare are quote unquote like allergic to, to technology. I think the key is to build uh, technology that is designed for the user. Uh, that is not the case today. Like if you look at, you know, the electronic medical records or like whatever, like most things are not built with the doctor or whoever is using it in mind. It's built with the um, the incentives in mind. And, and for EHRs, for example, they were created to help make billing better and to help you bill for more expensive things. And I actually secretly think, and I'll bet a lot of people would agree that they're at the core of why healthcare has ballooned in expense. So anyways. Whoa. Hot mm -hmm. take. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. E EHR, EHR tech providers. In mm -hmm. yeah, I, mean, I mean, the incentives are perfect, right? It's like yeah. they make more yeah. money so they can charge more for their software, right? So hospitals make more money. Like it's yeah. Like well, I don't even think they're intentionally doing it. It's just that you know the electronic med medical record companies. They're like, okay, how do we win in this space? So we we have to serve our buyers, our customers, whoever is paying us money. That's the health systems. The health systems, what do they care about is making money. And so they want to bill more. And so the EHRs, if they want to win those contracts, they have to make billing optimized. And so that's that's what happens. And then doctors, you'll hear like, like, oh my God, I've I've heard something like it takes 16 clicks to get from like, you know, typing, oh, the patient is blah, 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 to like finishing the encounter because you have to do a bunch of like billing steps in between. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That, that, that makes total sense. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with um, like the concept of the, the DMU, the decision-making unit. Uh, this came from Bill Allett from MIT, he wrote a book called uh, discipline entrepreneurship, but the decision-making unit is composed of basically the person who wants the thing, yeah. the, de like the decider, and then the person who's going to pay for it. And those can be completely yeah. separate. Then there's all these like tag along of people who like need to like gatekeep. But in this case, it sounds like, well, well yeah, yeah, we both know the people who pay for the stuff are actually really far from the people who use it. Right. Totally. Totally. 
Oh, you're talking about not only this microcosm, but the macrocosm of healthcare, right? Like we have a third party payer system um, and it's all sorts of messed up for that reason. <laughs> all sorts that, that, yeah. that is the most distinct way I've heard it described. Yeah, yeah. third party payer system is all sorts of messed up. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Cool, I only have a couple more questions. One, I just wanted to gl glance uh, off of briefly, which is we work a lot with um, personality data um, and we are really, keen and interested in personality. And so in, in some of our research, we found that psychedelics have this two-way relationship, meaning, mm -hmm. right, you have, you have uh, somebody whose personality changes because of psychedelics. Um, and also you have certain, psych uh, certain personality attributes leading you more towards receptivity to psychedelics. And I was mm -hmm. curious if you had any anecdotes or experience personally with this. Like, have you seen uh, these changes? Have you, have, you, have you observed this, basically? Yeah. Your personal experience? Yeah, yeah, I definitely had. And uh, so to talk about our some of our patients, you know, anonymously, of course, that like, it's definitely something that they sometimes don't even realize. But like, I've seen people where um, one example, there was a guy who came in and was like, Oh, I'm, I'm feeling, you know, anxious, down and stressed. And then they had one session. And uh, they went from being a totally silent stone like a stoic guy to being like really talkative and he was just like effusively describing his feelings and like just very expressive and then i don't even think he realized he was doing it that's the that's the funny thing i've noticed about a lot of people is they have a psychedelic experience and they don't even have enough awareness perhaps to recognize what changed um so that's one i've seen several and many actually examples of people who go from being uh very socially anxious there's something about social anxiety you know and then they become much less so like i've had people literally tell me like it's the first time in my life that i it, like enjoyed going to a party and like i've never felt that and i don't have social anxiety anymore like that was like fascinating to me um and then you know more you know personally and also seeing it more in friends who have done uh, psychedelic experiences is, you know, it definitely does open up creativity and art, 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 uh, artisticness. So right. like, even in myself, I, I have like a vague artistic streak, like sort of, and like, but after a session, like I find myself, like I have all these like vision boards on my wall, like, and I'm just like, that's so weird. And I think it's like, you have more focus and you also have more creative uh, openness. And so you start like wanting to create art is, is kind of the feeling that I get. Um, and then certainly one friend's experience, again, I don't think he's noticed it, but he went from being a relatively, you know, um, like a serious guy, like, you know, wouldn't really share much sort of like, off to the side at social gatherings and uh, went through his own psychedelic journeys, multiple of them. And then like, he's really blossomed. Like he's now like very friendly. He'll just like go up to a person and like talk to them. And I'm just like, something happened there. So, right. yeah. So the, the, the traits that you've taught, you actually, I think hit every one of the big five, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like increasing openness, specifically openness to aesthetics, increasing mm -hmm. tender-mindedness and warmth, which is agreeableness and extroversion, mm -hmm. decreasing neuroticism, well, obviously, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, neuroticism, like anxiety, depression, for example, just, just to name two. Mm -hmm. The interesting one for me is the idea of that maybe deliberation, right? You mentioned focus, deliberation could, um, mm -hmm. you're, you're like, you're, 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 your focus increasing is actually surprising. That would be more of like a conscientiousness trait, which I think mm -hmm. normally people wouldn't associate with psychedelics. They yeah. would be like, yeah, you're more focused after this. People would be like, no, nah, man, you're like, scatterbrained yeah. or, or, or right. P people decorrelate the openness and the conscientiousness. Those are not mm -hmm. actually, there, there's yeah. not a positive or negative correlation between those. Yeah. Things. I have a funny theory about um, the effects there is that I, so most psychedelics make it very hard for you to think properly. Like your cognition definitely goes out the window. I wouldn't yeah. like try to do math or anything, but like uh, what it does do by quieting down your default mode network and, uh, and also in general, like just making you, I think part of it is decreasing your cognition ability is that you can only focus on one thing. And, and uh, th there's a difference between different psychedelics. I do think like, some of the ones that are more dopaminergic, like LSD or MDMA, certainly like right. you'll be jumping off a wall. Like that's not the same, but right. the other, the quieter ones, like then you're just like, Oh, 
like I can only think about one thing right now and I'm going to do that. And as long as it isn't math or something like that, then it's, it's going to go great. So, right. Mm -hmm. Like this, that, that would be like the serotonergic ones, right? Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Serotonergic ones. Ketamine to some extent as well. Okay. Ketamine is uh it's glutaminergic. So it oh, kind of, yeah, it falls out of the pattern. Like you can't make any sort of usual predictions about it because it's hitting so many different things. Um, but yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a totally different mechanism. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So um, cool. Well, we're basically out of time, but I want to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, what's Curio doing today. And if you're, we want to shout out to anyone in the audience, is there anything that they can do to get involved or if they want to, uh, maybe if they want to use Curio, uh, is it available to the public? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, anybody can go to joincurio.com to uh, start exploring what we offer. And like I mentioned, we're a digital care navigation platform and that means so much. And we do both, the education piece, as well as uh, getting you in touch with a psychedelic provider, uh, legal ones, including uh, we do a little bit of care delivery ourselves, meaning like we do have our own virtual clinic that we maintain at a medium volume. And uh, the what is exciting, and I feel silly like bringing it in last minute to this conversation, but we are creating a lot of tools that are powered by AI and by nature of the AI that we use, it's much more adaptive to a person's needs. So the education is not just blog posts or videos. It's custom to exactly where you are in your phase of contemplation about like, oh, do I want to try psychedelics? Am I ready to? And I want to get in touch right now. Um, it's also very easy for a practitioner, like a physician, to hand over a quick summary and then, you know, a link to explore more to users. So uh, stay tuned. That is all in alpha right now, but we're releasing it slowly. Cool. Yeah. Hillary, thank you. This has been a total joy. Join Curio.com if you want to check it out. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for listening and have a great day. <laughs> thank you, Peter. Okay. Bye, Hillary. Bye.